<clears throat> they're thinking on now about 22. Okay. We're ready to go when you want. That's including staff, right? Uh, that's including staff. I mean, not move them over there. Okay. <clears throat> got in trouble one night at LCTI for starting the meeting early. Somebody from Allen's on object. <laughs> was Allen's in the order? It was advertised for seven of me. Another week for seven. Okay, seven, ready to go. Sir. Okay, welcome everyone that's uh, joining us tonight in the Northwestern Lehigh School District reorganization meeting, uh, which we will have before the regular board meeting this evening. And I would ask that at this time you join me for opening exercises. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for its stands, one nation under God. God. Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. And Christy, will you please call the roll? John Cassiano. Present. Willard Deliker. Here. Joseph Bassinger. Here. Todd Hernandez. Here. Todd Leiser. Here. Rosemary Lister. Here. Alan Rex. Here. Rachel Scheffler. Here. James Warple. Here. Everyone is present this evening, and um, <clears throat> next we will need approval of the agenda for the reorganization meeting, which is in front of us. A motion to approve. Motion by Mr. Rex. Second. Second by Dr. Warfel. Any comments or questions? Hearing none, all those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, no. We have an agenda. This time uh, we uh, welcome everyone to the meeting and offer courtesy of floor, but I would ask at this time if uh, anyone who is present <clears throat> that uh, during this courtesy of the floor of this meeting, please limit any comments to the board reorganization or the election of officers for the coming year. And I would ask that you please hold any comments not related to our board re reorganization for the regular meeting immediately following this meeting. Thank you for that. So uh, if there's anybody that would like to address the board regarding the reorganization, would you please raise your hand on your Zoom device? Do not see any. There's no one uh, raising your hand, so we'll move on to the uh, First item on the agenda, our next item on the agenda, which is the election of a president pro tem uh, to conduct the uh, nomination and election of the new president for the coming year. Is there a motion for president pro tem? Yes, I'd like to nominate Todd Hernandez for that position. Nomination for Todd, is there a second? Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, Todd, you're the president pro tem. Okay, at this time, I would like to uh, open up nominations for uh, the position of president. All right, I'll restart. I'd like, at this time, I'd like to open up nominations for election of the president of the Northwestern Lehigh School Board. I'll nominate Willard Deliker. Okay, Willard Deliker, do I, uh, Deliker, do I have a second? Second. Any other nominations at this time? Okay, uh, looking for a motion to close nominations at this time. Motion to close the nominations. Okay. Motion by Dr. Warfel. Second. Second. Second by Mrs. Shuffler. It's probably because I have my mind. All right, so I have a motion and a second. Uh, all those in favor for Bill Deliker to be, oh, uh, roll call, please, for the uh, <clears throat> election of the president, please. John Cassiano? Aye. 
Willard Delacher. Thank you, Bill. Yeah. Yeah. Abstain. <laughs> Joseph Batzinger. Aye. Todd Hernandez. Aye. Todd Leiser. Aye. Rosemary Lister. Aye. Aye. Alan Rex. Aye. Rachel Scheffler. Aye. James Ward. Aye. All right, we have a president. I'll pass it back to you. Thank you, Todd. You're really raising the bar for efficiency here. The next item on the agenda is the election of the vice president. I have a, a nomination for vice president. I'll nominate uh, Todd Hernandez for that position. Mr. Rex nominates Todd Hernandez. Second, second. Batsinger. Second by Mr. Fatsinger. A motion to close nominations. Motion to close. Motion to close, I believe that was Todd Weiser. No. Is there a second? Present. Second by Ms. Lister. So for the uh, vice presidency, we will have a, uh, or let's vote to close the motion first. We have a vote to close the, the motion. And uh, let's do this without a roll call. We'll just, uh, all those in favor of closing uh, the motion for vice president say aye. 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 Any, any opposed? So the motion carried. And uh, please call the roll for election of vice president. John Cassiano. Aye. Willard Delacher. Aye. Joseph Batzinger. Aye. Todd Hernandez. Yes, aye. Todd Leiser. <laughs> Yes. Rosemary Lister. Aye. Alan Rex. Aye. Rachel Scheffler. Aye. James Warfel. Yes. Thank you. A motion carried. Congratulations, Todd. Thank you. It makes it easy for the administration. We can keep our letterheads and our, <clears throat> our bank signatures the same for, for the next year. <clears throat> and at this time, to close before we close the meeting, I offer courtesy of four for anyone who would like to comment about the uh, reorganization meeting. Papers. Yes, sir. No one has raised their hand, so uh, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Motion by Mr. Rex. Second. Second by Mr. Hernandez. Meeting adjourned. <clears throat> and with that, we will move into the uh, regular board meeting for December. And I uh, would like to call the regular board meeting to order at 7.07. And again, I would ask you to please join me for opening exercises. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, and please be seated. And I think we need another roll call. Please. John Cassiano. Here. Willard Delacher. Here. Joseph Batzinger. Here. Todd Hernandez. Here. Todd Leiser. Still here. Rosemary Lister. Here. Alan Rex. Here. Rachel Scheffler. Here. James Warfel. Here. Thank you, all present, still. <laughs> And uh, with that, uh, would entertain a motion to approve the agenda for this evening with one change. Would like to uh, move the presentation by McClure Company 5.01 uh, up to and underneath 1.08, which is the uh, recognition presentations item on the agenda. With that change, I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda. So moved, Fatsinger. Motion by Mr. Fatzinger. Second. Mrs. Scheffler. All those in favor, aye. 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 No. Motion carried. We have an agenda. And again, welcome to all who are in attendance this evening. At this time, we will uh, 
uh, for courtesy of the floor. And since we have uh, a few people in attendance, I would like to uh, just go over the uh, rules for addressing the board at a public meeting in accordance with our policy number 006 for the efficient conduct of school district business meetings in a public setting. So the following rules will be followed this evening. First, any participants to address the board shall preface their comments by stating their name and their address. Second, each person will have a five minute time limit and the yielding of time to others is not allowed. And as much as we can using uh, Zoom this evening, uh, following our policy, uh, first, we will take comments about items that are on the agenda this evening. Those uh, comments will be heard first. And after that, uh, district residents will be heard first, after which non-residents who have an interest in the contemplated board action will be heard. So would you please um, reserve comments First, we will have comments about items on the agenda followed by district residents, followed by non-residents. And um, at this time, if there is any resident of Northwestern Lee High School District wishing to comment on an agenda item, please raise your hand on your Zoom device and be recognized. Mrs. Burt. Good evening. Thank you so much for having me with you today. Uh, my name is Catherine Bird, and I am a Low Hill Township resident, but tonight I'm speaking on behalf of Circle of Seasons at 8380 Moore Lane, Fogelsville, PA, 18051. And <clears throat> I would like to start by wishing you all a happy holiday season and also thanking you all for the very hard work that you do on behalf of the children of Northwestern Lee High School District. I know that you are all volunteers and I really appreciate um, the dedication and the, um, the intent to help our community make it the best uh, it could be. Um, I'm an educator and I also recognize the value and importance of providing a public school education that creates critical thinkers and global citizens. And as a lifelong resident of Low Hill Township, I have proudly witnessed the incredible growth and development of the Northwestern Lee High School District. From being one of the lower ranking school districts in the area when I was a little girl, um, I'm very proud that it is now in the top 10 in the Lehigh Valley, and this is a great accomplishment. And I, I thank you and I praise you all for being part of that positive and progressive transformation. So thank you so much. Um, I believe that one of the characteristics that supports Northwestern Lehigh School District's high ranked position is its offering of diverse learning experiences that suit the growing diversity of the school district demographics. Circle of Seasons Charter School offers families the option of an education that is focused on values that emphasize creativity, music, love and respect of nature and community building. My family has chosen Circle of Seasons as the school in the Northwestern Lehigh School District that best matches our family values. And I am incredibly grateful to have that choice. Our daughter has thrived in the lovingly constructed community of Circle of Seasons. When my relatives ask her, how is school? She always answers enthusiastically, school is awesome. COS is the right place for our family because the curriculum emphasizes the values that our family feels are most important to us. We are so appreciative of this school and for the opportunity it affords us. And I'm speaking to you now because it is of paramount importance to me, my daughter, and all of the students and families who so love the community of Circle of Seasons that its charter is renewed in a fair and timely fashion. 
please know that I am counting on all of you here tonight for your impartial participation in the renewal of the Circle of Seasons Charter. I'm depending on you, honestly, to ensure that my daughter and all the other students at Circle of Season need not worry about the future of their beloved school. This year has been so stressful and such a difficult year for our young learners and they need your support to ensure that they will be able to return to the school community that has been a constant positive influence on their lives. So please, on behalf of all the young scholars who are at the whims of your decision tonight, please renew the Circle of Seasons Charter. Thank you so much for your consideration. Thank you, Mrs. Bird, for your comments. And um, I think I, I should, um, I think I should bring it to everyone's attention who is listening in this evening that Circle of Seasons Charter Renewal is not on the agenda tonight. The, uh, the letters that the board has been receiving from parents and advocates of Circle of Seasons made it sound like uh, the word got out that we were going to discuss this or take action on the, uh, the approval of the of the charter this evening, but that is not the case. Uh, that is misinformation and uh, circle of season is not on the agenda. So uh, with that in mind, uh, we can move through courtesy of the floor, but uh, we will not be taking uh, any action on circle of seasons this evening because uh, the board has not yet reviewed the, uh, the charter renewal findings. And uh, we, uh, we will hold off uh, making any decisions until we work through that process. So if, with that in mind, is there anyone else, a resident of, New, of uh, Northwestern Lehigh, who would like to address the board on an agenda item? They just lowered their hand. So uh, my understanding is that no one has their hands raised uh, for privacy of the floor at this point. No residents. No residents. Are there any non-residents uh, in attendance this evening who would like to address the board? Yes, there's one. There's one. Mrs. Sager. Yes, good evening. Um, Allison Sager, 8380 uh, Moore Lane, Fogelsville, PA, 18051. Uh, I am the Circle of Seasons CEO and principal, and although I, we do know that we're not on the agenda this evening, we also know that um, we do need to respond to our inclusion in your last public meeting. And so I'm here to do that this evening. Um, I just wanna start out by saying, uh, as a school leader, much like yourselves, uh, we are models for our students. We show our children that when we engage and work together, we can be a powerful force. My students and their families know me. They know our board members as well. We're a community. And the Circle of Seasons community embraces a set of core values that are very important to us. As the leader of the Circle of Seasons community, integrity is very important to me. I lead a community of educators who are strong, thorough, mindful, careful, and deliberate. The question we collectively and persistently ask ourselves is what are we doing for others? We teach our students to be ethical, work hard, be thorough, and stand up for what we know is right. And, and you know, you as board directors also probably know this, but those who are happiest are those who do the most for others. That's uh, from Booker T. Washington. But more importantly, as school leaders, we model integrity for the children. So for that reason, I'm here today to not only advocate for the renewal of our charter, which I know you're not discussing this evening, but also to publicly correct misinformation that was provided to the Northwestern Lehigh School District Board of Directors at its public board meeting on November 18th, 2020. At that meeting, Ms. Hallman stated that my team did not submit responses to the Appendix B narrative portion of the extensive charter renewal document request. She may have been mistaken because she had not personally reviewed our submission. 
Had she done so, she would have seen each item in its appropriate folder with a document title clearly labeled with a B and the item number. On November 6th, we submitted on time 821 documents in 20 categories, nearly 2000 pages of evidence supporting sound and successful school operations per your request using a drive that Northwestern Lee High School District provided and an organizational format the district told us to use, a system of 59 randomly ordered folders that corresponded somewhat to the Appendix A items request. As there was no separate folder for the Appendix B items, we organized our extensive Appendix B narratives according to the topics of the district's folders, clearly labeling items as A and B with item numbers so that your team would be able to easily find each item upon review. The six minutes Ms. Hallman dedicated to viewing our submission, which took my team of 14 professionals two months to compile, would have been more clear to your superintendent with a more thorough dive into the folders. Last week to assist your team, we have also provided an organized index to help them navigate their own folders. My concern is that the Northwestern Lee High School District Board of Directors has been hopelessly misinformed by the superintendent, which may create bias as the board of directors engages in the renewal process. And as that misinformation was presented publicly, as well as indicated in a letter from your superintendent also asking for an extension on your own renewal timeline, I wanted to make sure the record is straight. We submitted all relevant and appropriate renewal documents in full and on time in response to your specific requests. I'd also like to remind the district that we are an email or a phone call away in the event any questions arise regarding the information the district would like to request or has already requested. We have always been forthright during the duration of the current charter and have provided any relevant documents required for monitoring our school's operations throughout this term. We're eager to work cooperatively with your team and fervently hope you will be as eagerly eager to work cooperatively honestly and fairly with us. We're all engaged in good, important work, educating our children. Our school supports children from families from the greater Lehigh Valley and beyond. You just heard from one of them, each eager for their children to benefit from the unique educational experience we offer. Circle of Seasons has always maintained a willingness to partner in this important work with our chartering district. This is a challenging time for schools and we don't have money, energy or time to waste. If we as a community don't step up to help and support each other, then who will? We look forward to a more constructive dialogue on this renewal going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Sager. Um, I think I will make a comment about what you just told us. And uh, over the last uh, week or two, the, our board members have received around 20 or so letters regarding Circle of Seasons charter renewal, all of which implied that our school board may not conduct, conduct a fair, impartial, and timely review of your school's charter application. I want to ensure you and the parents of Circle of Seasons that our board's top priority is the welfare of our children in every decision that we make, including children attending Circle of Seasons. Moreover, our board and administration have the integrity to do it fairly and equitably through careful consideration of all the educational, the social, the administrative, and the legal aspects of Circle of Seasons based on the years of experience since the implementation of the Circle of Seasons Charter. Um, the only comment that I would make is that we have a comprehensive response prepared um, that will be sent to Circle of Seasons Board of Trustees um, tomorrow that responds to tonight's um, comments as well as their letter. Thank you, Mrs. Holman. Uh, Dr. Sosnovic, is there anyone else that has their hand raised? There's about six. Six, so I'll okay. The next one. Uh, Pia Housel. Yes, hi, good evening. 
My name is Pia Hausiel, and I wanted to speak tonight in my role at Circle of Seasons as the Acting Director of Special Education. The address is 8380 Moore Road in Fogelsville. Thank you for your assurances a few moments ago. That is much appreciated. I wanted to comment that we're currently going through a parallel monitoring process to the charter renewal with the state level special education cyclical monitoring. Much like the charter renewal process, the Bureau of Special Education outlines a number of documents and files to review. They've requested those documents of us and we've provided them to them. This process started in August and continues on through mid-December. All of this has been conducted virtually as per the state's process this year due to, the, due to the pandemic. This includes virtual contact with our administrative team, with our special education and general education teachers, and also with our parents. In each and every step of the cyclical monitoring process with the state, we have found the process to be professional and handled with courtesy. Each and every step has been thorough and responsive on both the request end from the state and on our response end from Circle of Seasons. We've provided multiple documents, files, and our required facilitated self-assessment. We know these documents are reviewed and continue to be reviewed because of the follow-up questions and continued conversations we have had with our assigned Bureau of Special Education representative. We were and remain hopeful that we will experience the same courtesy and respect in which we have conducted ourselves with the Bureau of Special Education as we continue through the charter renewal process with Northwestern Lee High School District. We have provided multiple documents and essays in response to the multi-leveled requests from the districts. We look forward to the district reviewing those documents that were provided and to together moving forward with the renewal process. Thank you for your consideration and the opportunity to speak tonight. Thank you, Mrs. Housel. Is there anyone else who would like to address the board? Yes, sir. Mrs. Hyman. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Kimberly Hyman. I am the president of the Circle of Seasons School Board of Trustees um, located at 8380 Moore Lane in Fogelsville, Pennsylvania. I'm speaking to you because you have been misinformed by your superintendent about the responsiveness of our charter school to documentation requests related to our charter renewal process. Three days ahead of the deadline to submit documentation in response to our charter renewal application, our school's administrators uploaded 821 documents into the Google Drive set up by your administration. We addressed every single request related to the charter renewal process in one way or another. It took a team of 14 people away from their primary jobs to compile and compose responses to the district's requests in a timely manner. On November 18th, we received a letter from Ms. Holman stating that we had not responded to Appendix B. For context, Appendix B reads very similar to a charter application with specific questions requiring narrative responses. As the CEO, stated, um, we had uploaded these. It is disturbing because we had not only responded, but we had also uploaded everything. More disturbing is the fact that upon looking at the drive's activity since upload on November 6th, only four documents out of over 800 had actually been opened up. Worse yet was that instead of picking up a phone and inquiring to the status of the submission, which would have allowed us to explain where the files were located and organized, your superintendent chose to speak in public at your board meeting to our alleged unresponsiveness to document requests without checking with us for a response, but most importantly, even before checking the actual files. See, COS entered into this charter renewal process with professionalism and with excitement to illustrate to Northwestern Lehigh School District how much we have grown as a school in these last five years. We took to heart many of your very helpful critiques during our last charter renewal process and have become a much stronger school since the first charter renewal. And with Northwestern Lehigh School District's careful and holistic oversight of our school's charter. 
as the only remaining member of the COS Board of Trustees present during the previous charter renewal, I looked forward to having the opportunity to show off our school to our chartering district and to highlight how far we had come in terms of all the areas of focus for charter renewal, including school governance, financial stability, and student achievement. The COS Board of Trustees and administration anticipated that the results of a careful and fair review of our charter by our chartering district would continue to help us grow as an organization. We hoped that through this process, we could finally create a collaborative relationship between our school and our chartering district that will lead to better education for all of our students. You will recall that our board had repeatedly stated in our last charter renewal effort that our school wanted to be a partner with your district, not an adversary. Alas, it is with great disappointment that our highly professional efforts to put our best foot forward mm. and be responsive to Northwestern Lehigh School District's request, even with multiple redundancies with many files we supply on a monthly and annual basis per our charter agreement, were met with open hostility. There was absolutely no need for the hostility or the accusatory letter or untrue statements in public forums. We hope that Northwestern Lehigh School District will set the record straight tonight and correct erroneous public statements made last month. We also hope that Northwestern Lehigh School District will begin a careful review of our documents with the professionalism mirroring how they were compiled and will enter into a fair and impartial review of our charter renewal application. Mm -hmm. There is further documentation that you need from us, just ask. It is impossible for your district to even know what else is needed if or what is missing unless it first looks at what has been provided. To publicly accuse us of non-compliance with the district's requests without having looked at our responses and the documentations does not give our charter school community much confidence that you will enter into this review fairly and without bias. For the public record, I have sent a letter, I've attached or the letter I sent in response to Ms. Holm, Holman's uh, November 18th letter and her public statements at the board meeting last month. Um, I've also um, submitted to your uh, secretary of the school board evidence of no activity or little to no activity in um, the Google Drive. And I have also attached the index to guide you to find the files that we have uploaded into the Google Drive provided by your um, administration. Those three um, documents are in the Secretary of the School Board's email at this time. Thank you, Mrs. Hyman. Uh, I'm not quite finished, sorry. I just finished. Okay, thank you. Uh, and as, as one president to another president, I would, um, I have to uh, agree that the time required for renewal of these uh, charter schools is a drain on resources and time for both schools, both the, uh, the renewal school and the school doing the renewal and the uh, authentication that needs to be done for the state uh, charter requirements. But I have to say that uh, all these accusations of open hostility of misinformation and mismanagement of data is not a very collaborative, in your word, a collaborative beginning to this, this charter renewal. And I hope, I hope that, uh, that we can settle down and we can uh, uh, come up with some kind of a collaborative uh, condition that where our staff can review the items that are required by the state for us to review and monitor uh, without having to, uh, to get into uh, legal uh, legal conditions of lawyers talking to lawyers and that we can more openly solve these uh, questions that we have that we need to have answered uh, uh, with uh, some courtesy. Thank you. That is our fervent. Anybody else that would like Thank to address the board at this time? I do have one comment, Mr. Walker. Yes, Mrs. Holman. Um, I do have one comment. Um, the accusation that we did not review the files in entirety is false. And the information in your comprehensive response tomorrow 
will show the items that we did review and proof that we did so. And so you will get a response as the Board of Trustees tomorrow from the district that will entail and show that we have done exactly what you have accused me tonight of not doing. Is there anyone else, uh, Dr. Sosnovic, uh, anyone else waiting to address the board? Yes, sir. Azia Brittenberg, please. Hi. Can, can you hear me? I can't really, I don't really see everything going on there. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay. So thank you. Thank you all so much. My name is actually Ola Creston. Um, my daughter is Zaya, so she's been zooming a lot. Name again, My name is Ola Creston. Um, I am uh, also here to talk on behalf of Circle of Seasons Charter School, 8380 Moore Lane in Fogelsville. So I'm not here to, you know, be accusatory or anything like that. And I do appreciate all of your time. Um, at the end of the day, we're all parents or here for our children. Um, and we're really, I'm sure all on the same team. But I'm here to support my, to express my support of the charter renewal for Circle of Seasons. I have two beautiful children. They're full of fun, curiosity, life, and they are full of the love of learning. They're 10 and 12 years old. And like many children in this moment, they are struggling to keep it together during this complicated time. We're fortunate, however, in that although they struggle, there are a few things in their lives that have been rock solid for them since March. And the main thing has been Circle of Seasons. Both of my daughters have been in attendance at COS since kindergarten. My older daughter has been there since its inception in 2013. There has never been a single moment that I have not felt incredible gratitude for the education my children are receiving at COS. Both are reading at and above grade level. Both are excelling in math. Both have developed positive character traits that I believe are encouraged by the teaching style at COS, such as self-confidence, a sense of place, and the realization that they are part of a community. Also, their love of school is nurtured by the style of learning at Circle of Seasons. <laughs> My children love going to school. In fact, to be honest, they absolutely adore Circle of Seasons. <laughs> Um, throughout this year of virtual learning, they have had live experiences every single school day with their teachers, and they have all gone, the teachers have all gone above and beyond their tasks of teaching in a way I never could have expected, and I will never forget. Not only are they teaching our children the curriculum for this year, but they are also keeping the class intact as a class. My children do not feel isolated. They feel connected to their peers, to their teachers, and to Circle of Seasons as their greater community. And I cannot speak highly enough about the heartwarming, thought-provoking, meaningful schooling that the teachers at Circle of Seasons have provided for my children this school year. And I'd also like to share my praise for Principal Allison Sager, who has done an exceptional job at keeping the school running so smoothly during this pandemic. She has always kept Circle of Seasons families in the loop with her clear, thorough, and sensitive communication. We have always felt fortunate to be part of Circle of Seasons. I drive really far <laughs> to send my children to this school. Um, we feel that fortune stronger than ever now. They have shown incredible competence and diligence throughout this pandemic. The charter renewal is, not, is, is about the children who attend Circle of Seasons. And I am here to just share with you that my children would be utterly devastated if their school was taken away from them, especially at this time. They are hoping to be on campus next year. Our children need stability and support and a good education, and they have that. This is not about politics. It is imperative that the charter renewal is transparent, 
fair, and just. And I urge you to ensure that it is. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, uh, thank, thank you for your comments. comments. Uh, this time, I would ask that, uh, let me mention that we received uh, around 20 letters stating the same kind of uh, sincerity and, and passion that uh, parents have about their children and Circle of Seasons. And I would ask that uh, if you could uh, please limit comments this evening to new information that has not already been provided in the letters that her, our board has already read. Uh, this is not a hearing tonight. As I said, Circle of Season is not on the agenda. Uh, if there's anyone that would add, like to add something we haven't heard, I think we could have time to do that. But uh, the uh, renewal hearing and uh, discussion it will be on the agenda sometime in the future months, not this evening. Is there anyone else who would like to address the board at this time? There is two more. Two more? Alexandria Millspaw. Yes, hello. Um, thank you very much for your time. And, and uh, while I'm here to speak on behalf of, of Circle of Seasons and echo the comments that came before me, I will keep my comments uh, brief because I do believe I have um, one more th important thing to add. So again, thank you to the board for your assurances and your time this evening. Um, again, my name is Dr. Alexandra Milspa and I'm here on behalf of Circle of Seasons, 8380 Moore Lane, Fogelsville, PA. I am a therapist in the area. I run Four Directions Counseling um, and I specialize in trauma and chronic pain. Um, and I serve on the board of International Pelvic Pain Society, so I understand how boards work and I understand the, the intricate um, and important and honorable work that you all do and how important it is for the world and the community that we live in. Um, and what may, you may already know, but certainly the research demonstrates that adverse childhood events, including trauma such as the pandemic that we're living in and the trauma that the parents and all of you are experiencing, that greatly increases their risk of experiencing chronic pain and chronic illness growing up. And so one thing that one parent uh, mentioned this evening is the importance of something that is solid and secure and continuous throughout stressful events such as the pandemic that we're in. And Circle of Seasons offers that not only virtually, but when we are back in person, the approach to learning that they have truly understands the complicated dynamics of supporting children and their parents through difficult times. Um, and I'm not just talking again about the pandemic, I'm talking about difficult households and um, traumatic experiences in general. So what I, I have been looking at Waldorf schools for 20 years since I was a nanny to children who attended a, the River Waldorf School um, upper in Upper Black Eddy. And so when Circle of Seasons opened up, uh, I wasn't even married yet. My son was a twinkle in my eye and I already knew I wanted to be on the lottery. <laughs> um, so this school is very important to me personally, um, but professionally in training therapists and and counseling teachers in the greater Lehigh Valley and parents and their children. I, there is not a school that matches Circle of Seasons approach to support creating a supportive, safe, loving and holistically healthy environment for children that are experiencing the amount of stress that they're experiencing now and let alone again the support that they offer the parents and if we really want to help support um, a safe and healthy community and our children moving forward we need 10 of these schools um, let alone this one so with everything that I know and understand within the trauma and chronic pain world um, I really would be sad to see a, a school that understands learning, understands the importance of hands-on learning and connection with nature and outside time and movement time, rather than a lot of the other public schools where it is, um, you know, they sit still for so long and they don't get that much recess. And it's just not, it's just not good for a child's brain, let alone the absorption of material and information. So I kindly um, 
echo the comments that were made before me in terms of requesting a fair and complete and timely review of the charter material, but I strongly recommend approving their renewal as I do believe that is the, in the best interest of our children and our families throughout the greater Lehigh Valley and the future of our community. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Nilsoff, for your comments. Excuse me if I mispronounce it. Uh, David Matlovich. Matlovich, thank you. Matlovich. My name is David Matlovich, five six six three Worley's Corner Road, um, and I just want to thank the board at Northwestern in advance for the approval of the Circle of Seasons Charter Renewal. I know we're not doing that tonight, but um, I'm confident that our board, which I am a member and your board can work together along with our administration. I agree with what was said earlier that we can do this collaboratively and not waste our resources, including our time and the attorney fees. The better we work together, the better that we could accomplish this and um, work together in the future. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Matlovich. Is there anyone else? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Delaker. Being someone that's on the evaluation team uh, conducting this evaluation, I felt it important just to make a, a comment addressing the multiple concerns uh, that I heard tonight by uh, the Circle of Season families. Uh, as a matter of best practice when evaluating document submissions of this nature, particularly ones online. Uh, we followed a best practice rule and made a copy of the entire submitted drive to maintain the integrity of what was submitted to allow our district and legal team to complete a thorough evaluation. As Mrs. Holman shared, the Board of Trustees and CEO will receive a response uh, from us that will reflect the thoroughness and comprehensiveness of our evaluation that all the speakers have requested of us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sissman. Mrs. Sullivan? Yes, um, I concur with Dr. Sissman's statements. I mentioned tonight that we will respond in a very comprehensive way um, in, a, in a letter tomorrow that will show that we have reviewed the documents submitted. We um, do take this seriously. Um, to Mrs. Sager's comments, um, I believe when Dr. Sosnovic and I visited September or so, we explained, and this has rung true across all of the administration um, and boards at Circle of Seasons, that we do take our relationship seriously. We do take the, our responsibility seriously for the children that not only we educate, but the ed that are educated at Circle of Seasons. I have always looked forward to um, a collaborative approach. And you have always welcomed us, um, whether it be with documents or for a visit for our requests, um, to be able to do so. And so I look forward to that continuing in the future um, from here on. Thank you, Mrs. Holman. Are there any board members that would like to vote? Okay. Okay. And I would just like to reiterate in closing uh, with these uh, uh, comments uh, directed to our board is that uh, once again, I want to assure you that um, our board's top priority is the welfare of our children. And every decision that we make, including the children of Circle of Seasons, is also the top priority of our staff as well. And uh, hearing the, uh, the passionate uh, support of parents and their children, I can also assure you that uh, we hear the same remarks from our parents who are just as proud and passionate about the education, the teachers, and the environment that they have here at Northwestern Lehigh. So uh, with that, I will close out the uh, courtesy of the floor for this evening. There will be another uh, chance to address the board at the end of this meeting. But uh, for this moment, we will move into the next agenda item, which are, is approval of the minutes from the uh, Meetings uh, previous meetings that we have on the agenda.
February 18th. November. November 18th. Is there a motion to approve the minutes on the agenda? Motion to approve. Motion by Mr. Ritz. Second. Second by Mr. Hernandez. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. We have minutes. There are no recognitions or presentations this evening, so we will go into the, uh, the core presentation, which was moved up to the beginning of the agenda at uh, 7.49. Thank you, Mr. Delinger. Um, for you this evening, I have two, two representatives from McClure with us, um, John Bunny and Shane Holman. They're going to give a, a brief presentation. I think John is gonna do most of the talking. This is for a purchase of some um, bipolar ionization that we're looking to put throughout the district. It has multiple benefits, one of them being virus killing effects, but it also has the ability to improve our indoor air quality. Almost immediately as soon as it's installed and turned on, it is standalone units. Um, it is not a new technology, but it has an improved technology. So it would be something that would be installed in every occupied space of the district. That is across the academic areas as well as the gymnasium areas, the office areas, admin areas, something district wide to help indoor air quality of the, the buildings. I will turn it over to John and then I'll circle back around at the end. Okay. John, can you hear us? I can, Art. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, is my slide presentation up? It is, just ask us to advance slide when you're ready. Okay, so you can move on to slide two. And on slide two, again, uh, you know McClure, we have a history of collaboration with the district most recently at the high school building. Um, this slide just um, gives some history and background for those of you who uh, may be new to McClure, uh, showing our office locations across the state uh, with all those uh, bullseye marks identifying um, projects that we've done across the street. The company's been in business for 67 years. Um, and as I said earlier, has experience with uh, Northwestern Lee High School District. So if you wanna go to slide three, uh, as Art said, uh, we were asked to um, provide feedback uh, in, in direct relation to the pandemic and uh, responses specifically that are available through HVAC systems to the pandemic. And we've been really doing uh, things very similar to this presentation across the state for school districts just like you. And we ourselves have um, researched all of the different recommendations that have come through from a mechanical systems perspective from ASHRAE, CDC, and PDE, and have found that bipolar ionization um, for the cost value of it provides a number of the benefits um, that uh, we look to see to address uh, the COVID pandemic. So uh, as far as what is bipolar ionization, it's uh, technically defined as an air cleaning uh, system. So it's been around for a number of years and it would have been around in the past, it would have been marketed in the past uh, as an energy savings measure in that um, by cleaning the air, we could have designed a system with less outside air requirements. And by doing that, if we are bringing in less outside air, there would be less energy cost spend associated with tempering the outside air. So that's really the history of it, but it, and it always had additional benefits to it. But at that point in time, those um, benefits weren't really uh, viable in the educational or the commercial market. They were only really viable in the healthcare market. And we'll talk to that in a little bit. So how it works is there's a simplified graphic here of uh, the ionization kit itself is the device that gets installed within an existing HVAC unit, or it could go in the ductwork. And what that device does is it creates um, both positive and negative charged ions that are distributed through the airstream and move throughout the space as the simplified graphic shows. Um, from the perspective of um, these ions, ions are, uh, occur naturally in the environment, but they're found um, at, at high mountaintops, at waterfalls or at oceans um, where we have um, 
water friction that occurs or up at uh, high elevations is where we see higher uh, levels of ions. And as we progress uh, to lower elevations, as we move into cities and into buildings, we would see the, ion, the naturally occurring ion levels um, get lesser and lesser until they get close to zero. So they exist already in nature. And what we are trying to do now is to um, produce these in a man-made form. So we move to slide four. And, and I would add to with this, if, if at any time there's any questions, uh, I'm going to try to move through it pretty quickly. But if there's any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to ask. So as I said earlier, um, the, the main benefit historically uh, of bipolar ionization was by definition the agglomeration of particles, which is um, what, what, that, what agglomeration means is that when we, we create these positive and negative ions and they move throughout the space, um, think of magnets. Uh, looking for oppos oppositely charged particles in the space to attach to and, and self-balance themselves. So when we have these charged particles, they want to merge with other particles, thus making larger particles. And when we make larger particles, those particles are easier to filter out of the air. So uh, one of the main benefits right now is um, CDC and ASHRAE, uh, and, and a number of these government and industry uh, groups are recommending that we proceed to, 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 to go to more efficient filters. But there's drawbacks in that, in that, you know, there's lead time issues, there's cost issues associated with getting the filters, and there's also the limitation of existing motors that are in existing equipment that can't really take the higher MERV efficiency levels. So the technology through that agglomeration of particle effectively makes whatever filter exists in a HVAC unit right now more efficient. So that checks one box for us and that it's making our existing filters more efficient, which is one of the things everybody's looking for. Uh, where the real game changer came was in May or June um, when uh, the first uh, bipolar ionization manufacturers um, came out with test data specifically related to SARS-CoV-2, which is the COVID-19 virus. And in that testing, uh, in their third-party testing, they found that in their test, uh, after 30 minutes, 99.4% of the virus particles in the test were rendered inactive uh, by the ions after 30 minutes. And the way that that occurs is, is so again, we have these positive and negatively charged oxygen uh, molecules that are moving through the space. Uh, they want to attach to other particles. And so in the case of a virus, what they do is, is if you can picture, you've probably all seen that, that uh, artist rendering of the SARS-CoV-2 virus itself, and it's a ball with the spike protein sticking out of it. The, the outer la layer of, of the viruses are um, protein, and they need hydrogen to sustain the protein. When that uh, ion attaches to the virus, it extracts hydrogen to self-balance itself. When it extracts hydrogen, uh, it um, deactivates the proteins and therefore deactivates the virus. So the virus is no longer infective. So that's why they refer to it inactivating viruses. In terms of bacteria, they have similar test data with uh, bacteria and MRSA and mold in that these a bacteria is different than a virus in that it is living and it has DNA. So in that case, if, you, if we go back to science class and we think of uh, at the DNA level, um, we have the double helix and the double helix of DNA is the bonds of those steps, the rungs on that ladder are, are based upon hydrogen. So it's the same premise where the ions attach will strip hydrogen away, the rungs of the ladder break and the DNA splits apart, killing the bacteria. So that leads to the next line item there that is odors. And where we have seen these historically used in the past in, say, school districts would have been in, uh, say, uh, wrestling rooms, uh, locker rooms, um, equipment drying rooms like football equipment where uh, districts were dealing with odors because of their impact on bacteria and killing bacteria, it uh, eliminates the odors that come from the bacterial growth. I list there as another, op uh, another benefit of the bipolar ionization is that there is a future opportunity to reduce energy usage in that the mechanical code allows us, if we're using air cleaning technology, to reduce the amount of outside air that we bring into the space. Now, at this point in time, what we've been telling all districts and folks who are working with us 
on, with this device that we would not recommend right now reducing the amount of outside air that we put into a space because everything we want to do is get more outside air into the space. For us, this checks another box in that um, after the device is installed, technically the outside air could be lowered, but if you keep the outside air at the same level it's out right now, you're exceeding what the code is now telling you your outside air is. So it's now a way to exceed the code required outside air um, without purchasing new equipment with larger heating and cooling capacities that you would need to get the same net benefit without the cleaning technology. So uh, what I've also included here are a couple of snippets from um, some testing that we've done. So uh, in the upper right-hand corner, this is actual test data for a district where we, um, we are not, um, things that we can measure are is we can measure to make sure that yes, we are getting ion production in the space after the device is, is installed. And we can also expect to see less particle counts in the space after the device is installed because our, our first point we made is that it's a cleaning technology. So we expect to see particle counts drop. So in the case of this school district, this is just a snippet of some of the testing that we did. And what you can see up is in the, in the top um, section there where it says, cumulative particle counts um, before the device was installed in the case of room 105 we were up at a total total particle count of 9,000 and uh, once the device was installed and we came back afterwards and the device had been running it had dropped to close to 5,000 so again this is verifying for us okay we're we're seeing what we expect to see and then if you move to the to the next um, section of that upper right-hand corner where it says total ion levels. Again, this is the same re room where we've measured a before and an after to see, okay, let's definitely make sure that we're getting ion production because again, we can't see um, or smell ions. Um, so for us, we have to measure them with, with uh, a testing device. So for us, this is our way to verify that yes, indeed, you know, we are seeing the ion production. And then finally, on the bottom section of this slide uh, is some additional test data that we did. So uh, when the claims were first being made uh, to us in direct relationship to the pandemic, we wanted to see for ourselves um, and verify for ourselves that you know what the manufacturers were telling us made sense. So what we did was for a period of, of about seven or eight weeks, we uh, installed these devices in an elementary school um, in sample rooms. It was an elementary school we had done a project with about three or four years ago. And we took four identical classrooms and the top row there says base reading with standard filter. So that's, in this case, all these readings are on the very same day. But what the difference between the readings is the, the, the top row there was a room that we did nothing to. So it had a standard Mervate filter in it. Um, no bipolar ionization installed. And you can see uh, particle counts at up at uh, 1,670 in that case on that day and ion counts at 800. As we move to the next row down, uh, we took an adjacent room and we installed the bipolar ionization. And you can see, as expected, we see a net decrease in the total, total particle counts. That blue uh, line is moving further to the left. And we also see the green line extreme far to the right that we're getting ion production. We took it a step further and we, um, we wanted to see the impact on MER 13 filters, which is a recommendation from CDC and ASHRAE. And we could see there, again, what we would expect to see. We see reduced particle counts from an improved filter, but we don't see any ion production. So in that case, you know, it offers the benefit of, of reduced particle levels in the space but we're not getting the ion benefits of actively deactivating viruses and killing bacteria. And then finally, the bottom row there, we wanted to see the impact. Um, we were getting questions about, well, what's the benefit of stacking some of these um, options? So the bottom row shows uh, combining both bipolar ionization and the MERV-13 filter. So you can see in that case, you know, we've got the high ion production and, and, and even slightly more reduced um, particle count in the space. So for us, what was important for us here was um, testing at multiple points um, to verify that, you know, the, the feedback that we're and the commentary that we're getting from manufacturers 
um, that we can um, feel comfortable with that information. What I'll also add here is, um, as part of the proposal that we provided to Northwestern Lehigh was uh, something similar to what you would see in the upper right hand corner there, that we've included time to take some sample readings before and after as well to verify that you are indeed getting ion production in the spaces where you should be getting it. And we should be seeing uh, correspondingly reduced particle counts in the spaces as well. Um, just a couple other things to note with this. Um, this equipment, um, another one of the, the, the reasons we see this as a benefit is um, the manufacturers are documenting this with a 10 year lifespan. So it's not like something like uh, UV lights, let's say, where uh, the bulb needs to be replaced every year. There's uh, virtually no maintenance with these devices um, once they're wired in and hooked up. So you're not looking at a recurring expense annually to service them. Um, some of the, um, some similar but different technologies, um, while they do things that are similar, similar, they are producing ozone. And so in the case of the, the needle point bipolar ionization, um, it's uh, fully compliant with the multiple UL ratings. So UL 867 and 2998 um, for essentially no ozone production, which is another benefit of the system. Um, and one of the other benefits that, that um, we really like about this is uh, some of the other technologies like a UV system that might come into the, you know, a portable unit that you bring in, it's going to come in after hours once students and staff have left and it is going to um, work, say, overnight. In the, in the case of bipolar ionization, because it's installed within the HVAC system and we want the HVAC system and the airflow to be picking up the ions and pushing them throughout the space in the airstream, it's actively working when the space is occupied, which is when the HVAC system is on. So, um, you know, there's no ozone associated with it. Um, the, the needle point bipolar ionization is um, specifically designed um, so that it doesn't exceed any levels where there's any um, negative reactions with any unanticipated reactions with any, um, um, or any uh, chemicals that could become toxic or um, um, pr provide a, like a negative interaction. Or, so um, for us, it's something where when we've compared it to filters and to, to UV technology or to just holistically trying to increase outside airflow or running systems 24-7, when balancing all the benefits versus the costs associated with it, we found that bipolar ionization um, has risen to the top in terms of technologies available. So with that, you could go to slide five. And this just shows um, what the next steps would look like. So we have provided a proposal to Mr. Oaks um, um, using CoStars um, that would apply district-wide to the high school, middle school, Northwestern Elementary, Weisenberg Elementary, the district administration building and the district operations building. Um, one thing that is important to note with this that you know, we have noted there can be a phased or a streamlined approach. So if it's something where uh, if, it, if it benefits the district to um, work building by building, um, if it's best to try and do it all at once, um, you know, we, we can work to whatever the best approach is for the district. Um, and, and obviously we've, we've um, brought it here tonight and we have um, included here uh, for, um, for thought process what a schedule would look like for this. We've done this successfully at, at a number of other school districts. And typically what we find is one of the benefits of these devices is that they are a two to three week lead time item depending on the model that we're we're buying and the model varies based on the size of the HVAC equipment. Um, and that we have been able to install these district wide for other school districts in a period of two to three weeks. And so, you know, while some of the devices begin to arrive earlier, we can begin if it suits the district needs to install um, as those earlier devices arrive. And then as some of those later devices arrive, we would follow up with the installation of those devices at a later point. Um, 
So that, that is also availability is another one of the benefits with bipolar ionization. So with that, I'll open it up for any questions. Um, in slide six is contact information for myself um, and for Shane, who is our Vice President of Energy Services. Um, we do have also, if there would be benefit, we can also forward um, the manufacturer's uh, third-party test data that covers all of the um, uh, different viruses and bacteria, including the SARS-CoV-2. We can provide uh, that information if that's something that you would be helpful. Um, but again, the, the goal of this is to get these ions that, um, that we see um, in what's often deemed the cleanest uh, areas of our environment, of our world. Um, and we're now trying to um, generate these into buildings to gain those same benefits that we get from, from being in those outdoor environments, but um, pushing those into the, into the indoor environment. Um, thank you. Um, this is Jennifer for John and Shane. Um, so apparently, thank you for presenting to us tonight. Um, well, there's a few reasons why we brought this forward to the board tonight. One is obviously, you know, we've had some issues in, in at least one of our buildings from mold several years ago, as well as you've heard us say in terms of our mitigation strategies, having, you know, students in the building and staff in the building. It's really about a, a trifecta and layering of approach to mitigation to keep everyone safe. And so certainly hand washing is part of that, or sanitation is part of that, social distancing is part of that, and ventilation is part of that. And so one of the approaches er, Art did early on was to McClure, who's been a good partner with us, to say, you know, what can we do to increase the filtration, the ventilation, the outside air intake? Um, and they gave us some of those recommendations early on about the outside air intake and trying to, as you've heard, John say, bring as much outside air into as possible. As we, you know, I've entered winter months, that's less and less desirable with it being cold. And so this was a solution they brought to us um, as a potential solution for installing in all of our classrooms and occupied spaces across the district. Um, Leslie is on, and I believe that she has a potential solution for financing it if you should wish to continue with it. And I do believe, um, we have some lead time in terms of getting the devices should you want them and getting them installed um, if that should be the desired for it. And so I will ask Art if he has any additional comments or John. Yeah, before I comment, does anybody have any questions for John? Um, any of the board members? Yeah, I do. <clears throat> hey, John, um, you mentioned ozone and I kind of cut out there. What, did you mention what type of levels that are put out? Yeah, so with the needlepoint bipolar ionization technology, it's listed as a, as a zero ozone, as a no ozone producing uh, device. Um, so what they do is, um, I'll geek out into some of the details a little bit, there's an electron volt uh, reading uh, that they control to electrically. And that magic number they want to stay under is roughly 12.1, 12.07. And when you stay underneath that um, electrical production, there's no interaction uh, with the oxygen to create ozone. So it's one of the benefits of this needle point technology where there are other, um, there are two UL ratings. There's UL867, which is current right now, um, which most manufacturers would comply with, but there's also UL2998, which has been approved by ASHRAE in 2019. And what that means is it's probably about five to seven years away from becoming a code. But the forward thinking manufacturers are already looking ahead to that and certifying themselves in accordance with that. So in this case of the manufacturer we've been partnering with, which is glo called glo Global pa Plasma Solutions, they are looking towards that UL 29, 2998 and are already certified with that. So it is a no ozone producing um, technology. Good question. Are there any other questions for John? Uh, yes, I, I have a, a, a couple. So will this help with the mold remediation if possible? Will it help to keep the mold down? Yeah, so um, one of the tests that they do have is with mold. So again, mold is really a form of bacteria. It's gr it grows like bacteria does. So in this case, yes, um, it is something that would, would also help with mold growth. Now, it's not going to it, it would directly um, 
impact mold, it, it will not control humidity. So if there's any, you know, when you think back to, if there was an event where there was a mold situation, you know, probably going back two to three years ago, uh, there may have been uncomfortability in the building with, with humidity. It doesn't control humidity, but it, it controls um, the, the negative impacts that occur as far as mold growth. So yes, it is, is, um, is beneficial for mold control as well. And my next question is the, uh, does, it, does it have any odor to it when it's pushed into the air? Uh, no, it does not. Um, and so that's one where uh, some of the, the devices that do produce some ozone have an odor associated with them. This device does not have any odor associated with it. So this is where, um, you know, it, what, what they, where we would have seen these installed in the past, more than likely in a school, would be in those, um, actually the odor generating areas like those fitness areas, locker rooms and the like to neutralize those odors. But the device itself and the ions that are produced, there's no uh, odor associated with it. Okay, and did you do any testing in our buildings, uh, air quality testing at all currently? No, we have not done anything specifically uh, in Northwestern Lehigh. Thank you. Um, so, for, uh, Todd, I'll add, I'll add on there. We actually have one of these devices in a middle school classroom that we tested just for the smell aspect and, and how it runs. Um, I'll ask John to just reiterate that it is safe to be running while we're occupied in the building. But I'll also add that um, we did do our typical air, indoor air sampling that we always do twice a year. So, that has occurred and, and everything's good in all the buildings in our random samples. So, we don't have any current issues. Yeah, I can reiterate uh, that. Yeah, this is a 100% safe technology uh, when occupants are in the space. It's one of the reasons we specifically like this technology because it is operating and fully functional when that HVC system is operating. And I, I go back to where we see naturally occurring ions in the world around us are the places that people go to on vacation to get um, cleaner air, essentially. Um, so that they're definitely beneficial to have in space because of all, and, and the testing data shows all that. As far as, just to go back, as far as um, what we did include as part of this is um, similar sampling, if the district would like, um, as part of this proposal to do some pre-readings in some sample rooms in each of the buildings, and then to come back and do some sample readings in those very same spaces after the devices ins are installed, um, just so that everybody um, has the peace of mind that the devices are doing what they're intended to do and that we're getting the ion. It's really, we want to see that we're getting the ion production in the space um, because the ions are what are doing the heavy lifting for um, all of those benefits. Thank you, John. Any other questions from board members? You want to talk about the financing? Yeah. You want to yeah, before she does that, I just want to make one, I guess, anecdotal comment about experience I've had with these ionizers at uh, LCTI. And this was back 15 years ago before the current technology that eliminates the ozone. But uh, we put them in uh, for the agglomeration uh, effect in our uh, carpentry labs to keep the dust down. It, 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 and what it did was charge the uh, the particles, like was described, plus or minus, they, they uh, came together and just dropped out of the sky, out of the air, so that we didn't have that cloud of dust continually in the uh, carpentry labs. And the other area we used it was to eliminate odor in the cosmetology labs, which uh, have a lot of unpleasant odors. And uh, it, uh, it actually did remove the odors from that lab and uh, made a more comfortable environment for the teachers and the kids in there. So, you know, as far as the uh, effectiveness, the functionality of, uh, of uh, getting rid of orders and particles, it, uh, it worked really well. So, uh, Leslie. John, hold on. John, one more quick question. Sure. Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure how our system fully works. Um, is there any effect to um, outside air, um, you know, fresh air that comes in? Um, so 
the device would be installed in the terminal equipment that serves the spaces. Good question. Um, just one other thing to help you understand what we've looked at in this is we look at spaces where people are. So we're trying to, you know, we understand that, you know, there's financial implications. So where we look for these are in the spaces where we see people. So offices, classrooms, the gyms, cafeterias, where we don't look to, to install devices are in storage rooms or transiently occupied spaces like vestibules. As far as um, the benefit to outside air, um, I would look at it in this way. The outside air is brought into the terminal equipment. Um, so uh, say I'm very familiar with the middle school because we had just looked at that building and there's unit ventilators in there that sit under the windows along the exterior wall. That re recirculates the air that moves through there is probably about 75% a recirculation of the indoor air and 25% of the air is probably coming in from outside air. Both that outside air, um, which we would de deem to be diluted and should be um, mostly free of, in this case, pandemic virus particulate, um, is gonna merge with that indoor air, um, which is the air we really wanna clean and filter and we want to deactivate viruses that are inside the space. Both, both those air streams combine and will move across um, this device. So at the point where the device is installed, the outside air has already been brought into the system and has been mixed in with the, um, with, it, with the indoor air. And as I said earlier, you know, there is potential in the future that by code, you could reduce that amount of outside air. But right now we want to keep the system. We know it is capable of say that 25% outside air. We know if you went over that, you would probably, more than likely, you would have humidity issues in spring and fall, and you would have uh, cold temperature complaints in the winter. So we know that we're limited with what the system can do in terms of capacity. Um, so we wanna keep that outside air, that dilution air at that same high level right now, because we know the system can do it, um, but we get the benefit of those ions being added to, to both of those air streams, essentially, both the recirculated air and the outside air. Thanks, John. Sure. Art? Yes. Okay. Um, so what we have here is a proposal from the floor, um, as, as you see in front of you, for $331,657. That's to install the district. It also does give the verification um, proof after it is done in, in a random sampling of the buildings. We would like to move this forward. There is a few changes um, to this document that Jess has reviewed. Um, the floor has agreed to. Jess is finalizing the document. So there's a few changes from this document. I would ask you to approve it pending Jess's final approval. However, she she's finishing it up in the next day or so, and then we'll get it over here for signature. Um, and, and again, I'll throw it to Leslie unless you have questions for me. I do believe that this is coming from the remaining capital project from the high school, so it shouldn't be a budget impact, but Leslie can certainly talk about that much clearer than I can. Um, and if you have any questions, then I know Ms. Holman has. Yep. The only comment I have before Leslie talks is you just heard John mention it, and I think it's important to reiterate, just like we layer mitigation strategies in terms of, of COVID response and trying to keep people safe, we do that with everything else. And so John just alluded to the two methodologies for ventilation to be able to help, whether it's mold or flu or whether it's COVID, is dilution of the air, which he referenced, and if he has anything to add to this, he apparently the expert. Um, diluting the air by bringing in additional outside air is certainly a methodology, but also treating it. So you're kind of hitting this, in two, if, if you would decide to go forward and install these, you're not only diluting the air and, and bringing in additional outside air more regularly, you're also treating the air that's recirculated through the, through the unit. And so I think that's important because everything we talk about is, is layering of mitigation strategies, whether it is, you know, with students, with safety, but, you know, regular safety, as well as flu virus or COVID. And so um, I just want to make sure I point out the dilution part as well as the treatment part. And then any other questions for John, certainly, or, or if Leslie would like to um, talk about funding. Leslie, are you on? Yep, I'm here. Thank you. Um, so we, Art and I took a look at our current capital projects funding, as well as our facilities master plan and looked at you know, what did our five year plan say and what are our available funding streams. And so I reworked some of that funding 
Um, currently, we have about $475,000 of excess high school construction money left over. Um, so our recommendation would be to utilize that existing funding um, for this project, which still leaves us a remaining balance to be allocated to future projects. Um, we had previously earmarked that for some facilities master plan um, projects. However, um, again, after looking at that, um, certainly with due to the pandemic and everything going on, we believe we should delay some of those product, um, some of those projects, which would then allow us to free up those funds to utilize now for this project. Questions for Leslie. Dr. Wolfe. I don't have a question for what well, I guess it's related. It's a, it's a pretty big dollar figure, and uh, certainly you have to be able to justify that kind of expense. It seems like the biggest driver in this whole discussion is related to the COVID virus and reducing um, its prevalence in the air within within all the buildings. Is there any, is there any way to quantify that to, to the degree to which we think we're improving? Are we reducing the likelihood of contagion within the schools as a result of this? Um, I don't know, I'll ask John if he knows that, but I guess I would respond that it's not the timing, I believe, is responsive to that. I don't know that the installation is. So if I believe that we were spending this kind of dollar for just this, I'm hoping short term pandemic and relative terms, um, I don't know that I can support that. But when you see other schools have installed these for other flu, cold, mold, um, regular seasonal things that happen throughout other years. So I think the timing of the installation is COVID related potentially, but I think the benefits are far reaching even after the pandemic is over. But yeah, yeah, and I'll, I'll add to that, Dr. Warfel, that we've, we've looked at this previously in the past um, a couple of times, and I think the COVID reasoning is, is certainly an added bonus. Um, in their air quality in the buildings and the facilities as we get them tighter, as we continually strive for that energy saving, it gets harder and harder to maintain those standards. Um, some of those asteroid standards that John mentioned about the amount of outdoor air that needs to come in, our systems aren't designed necessarily to maintain the heating load and, and the cooling load that's required to do all of that. So this is an, an added bonus that, that just complements what's going on right now. And as Ms. Holman referred to, the, the flu viruses and the, and the pertussis cases and all those things that we battle in the indoor air quality in schools, this just helps it and, and I think it's an added benefit. No, I, I, I get that, and I think that's uh, very valuable, especially mm -hmm. after the circumstances we had in middle school and, and, and the possibility of that continuing anyway. But, but the immediate issue right now that is on everybody's mind, having kids and staff in the building is their safety. And I, I just don't know that there's any way. It sounds to me like it's a no brainer that you're going to reduce the likelihood of virus in the school. I just, uh, I can't help but think there's some way to, to quantify. Well, John, John, John to quantify think, of the virus percentage. I don't yeah. know. John, I think you talked about that earlier. There was a study with the virus 99.4 or something. Did you refer to that? Are you still on that, I got, you should be able to hear me now. Um, so yes, you are correct. Um, that was what I was saying in, in I believe it was late May uh, was when the, this manufacturer first had their test data specifically rated to SAR, related to SARS-CoV-2, showing the 99.4% deactivation rate after 30 minutes. What I'll also add is, you know, I know there was some commentary there about moving forward, and we are seeing um, a changing trend and, an, and um, an emphasis now on HVAC systems as more than just heating and cooling systems. Um, you know, we... Prior to this, there was push to incorporate dehumidification as part of um, HVAC systems. So we were seeing a more holistic approach to indoor air quality, but now we're really seeing um, folks are valuing what was once only really looked at as being viable and important in the healthcare world is that this has shown that this is important in all buildings. Um, so what I would say is, is um, you would see similar test uh, results um, 99% and above for your typical flu viruses, your previous coronaviruses, and all of the other uh, viruses that they've tested this technology with. But I would also say, and this is one of the things that I've heard said uh, in your room there, is that this is, um, this is specifically to address uh, 
the virus itself in the aerosol form. The, so what we're talking about is the virus in the airstream. And so, you know, when there's been study of some of the super spreader events and that, um, you know, occurred, some of it was related to specifically to um, HVAC systems and lack of ventilation air and the like. Um, so this is specifically to address um, what I would say is one of the two big um, means at which the virus can spread. Certainly um, educating students and staff on maintaining social distancing and washing hands and wearing the masks. All of that is going to be important as well. This is not a solution where, you know, we can go back to, you know, removing the masks and, um, you know, and, and forgetting what we've learned in terms of, um, trying to keep our distance, stay at home when you're sick, wash your hands, all of those things. It's, it is a multi-layered uh, approach, but this is, um, in terms of, say, comparing it to an alternative opportunity, such as installing filters. You know, with filters, you would be trying to um, capture um, particulates that has the virus attached to it within the space, whereas this is our most proactive means to... Um, let's say, attack the virus in that aerosol form in the airstream. John, I, I do have one more question. Um, this this kind of goes back to last year or, or so when we, we talked about the middle school. And um, if I remember correctly, maybe some of the units weren't, um, efficient enough to heat and cool um, s certain rooms uh, is, and I noticed on page five of the quote, there there is a uh, um, kind of a, let me, in fact, I'll read it. It says, please note exact counts of rooftop unit equipment may differ due to design and implementation of the system. Is there a chance that you're saying that we may need more in a bigger room, in a bigger space? No, um, really what that, should, what that really should mean is, so the quantities are, that are listed there, the, those are the quantities of the existing units that you have. So in the case you brought the middle school, we have a count um, from, from working with Mr. Oaks of seven air handling units and 63 unit ventilators. What that comment is referencing is that the exact count of the devices that we install may differ slightly from what you see there, because there might be a larger unit that, say, requires two devices. Uh, so uh, all, the, all the equipment is covered, but on our end, the actual number of devices that we install might be slightly different than the counts that you see there. Did that help clarify that? It did. And I guess what I'm getting to, and you probably can't answer this, is, you know, I, uh, I'm not sure on the cost of each particular device. So are we, is the potential there that we have a number of rooms that may need two devices? Uh, you know, are we looking at a, a larger cost impact? I'm just doing my due diligence here. No, and that's very wise of you, and the answer to that is no. That's just for you to know that if you, if you came out after the fact and we give you as-built drawings and there would be a different device quantity list, that, that unit quantity of existing units should, always, should still be the same, but the actual number of devices may be different from that. But no, you would not see a difference in cost from this proposal of what you have here tonight. Thank you. Yeah, John. I... If I could, this is Shane. I'll just I'll just add to that. Um, essentially, saying the same thing that John just said. But so to develop these proposals, rather than come in and do a, an exhaustive survey of every single unit getting above the ceilings, we know that that space, a big space, for example, is served by a rooftop unit. It may it may require two devices to treat the air appropriately. But if we figured one, that risk falls back on us. So to do it right, if it needs two, it's going to have two. John, I have a question for you real quickly. The, uh, the, this quote is to, um, it's for the each room or classroom, if you will, office 
space, but it won't clean the air of any hallways and vestibules. Correct? Yes, so that's correct. Um, so what we've looked at is, and again, that could be different if it was something that the district wanted us to pursue. Um, but what we have looked at is as our baseline, and this is the same for all the districts we've been working with, is as a starting point, focusing on those areas that are continuously occupied. So in you know the discussions we've had leading up to this time, it's been in, in with regard to a vestibule. You know, we're looking at um, people coming in and out for five to 10 minutes a day, and the rest of the time, the space is at rest for, for a uh, corridor area. Uh, there's a three to five minute period potentially between classes where there's a passing of people within the space, but then that area is, sits at rest for the remaining 40 minutes. So um, the way we've looked at it thus far is um, trying to um, optimize the benefit of it and focus on the areas where there's that continuous occupancy and in some of those um, marginally occupied spaces that um, there's a higher dilution level, say, that can occur because of the limited occupancy that does occur. But again, that's something that could, um, you know, could, could change it if it needed to. Thank you. Sure. Hey, Art, I have a quick question for you. Yes, sir. These units run all night? Are, are units in the rooms run all night, essentially? They do not. When we um, went into a COVID pre prevention recommendations or part of our mitigation strategy, we turn them on earlier and run them a, an hour longer, but we do not run them all night. They, they do shut off uh, about two hours after school, roughly, so the give or take with the schedule. They're still scheduled to not be nice. My my thought was if if they ran for an extended period of time after the school was empty and the, and essentially the rooms were left open, is there any benefit to cleaning you know more air than just what's in the room? Well, working working with McClure and, and John can certainly talk about that. The the amount of exchange or the amount of time that it takes to exchange that air in the room is roughly one to two hours max. That's completely with outside, and I think it's six to seven times per hour if it's exchanged within the room. And John, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so within that amount of time that we're running it extra, we've basically cleaned all of that air. So we feel as an energy savings, there's no real benefit to running. Yeah, I would second that, Art. Um, you're spot on with that. And then what I would also add, I mean, one of the benefits too is, you know, remember we're um, producing these ions in the space, so. You know, part of what's going into our um, our baseline of selecting um, the areas that we have is that uh, when students do go to move classes, you know, to, to the classroom itself, you know, we're producing ions or the gymnasium or the cafeteria, as they leave those spaces and doors are open and they're traveling out, you know, there's ions moving with them. Um, so uh, again, one of the one of the, one of the benefits too of that um, what uh, Mr. Oaks is decide, describing is essentially a pre and a post purge operational cycle. And what you're doing is, is, um, you know, you're flushing the air with flushing the space with some outside air before students and staff arise, arrive. And then after they leave at the end of the day, you're essentially doing another purge of the air, air within the space. And all that time with this equipment installed, there would be ions being produced and moved around the space. So you're, you know, you're essentially starting that, that, that uh, purge and cleaning process before the students arrive and staff arrive, and then after they, they do it to kind of provide those two um, opportunities, the belts and suspenders, if you will, before and after the school day. All right, I'm done, thank you. <laughs> Is there a uh, equipment availability issue with this, uh, with these ionizers as the word gets out and uh, more and more people are looking at this? That would affect our timing. Shane, I think you have uh, a, a contact for these ready to go pretty quick. Is that correct? Yeah, so we, we actually put in a what we call a conditional purchase order that we can hold them for a week and a half, uh, which we've already done. So if, if you guys approve it, good. If, if not, we'll just let them know that, that um, you've moved in a different direction. But it, at least move this up in, in the... Uh, lead time line, so to speak. And they're readily available. Any other customers, you're, you're getting them as expected within the three weeks? 
Yeah, we haven't experienced any uh, issues yet, knock on wood, but they are certainly gaining in popularity. We're obviously not the only ones putting them in, but so far, um, a good success getting them in, you know, in a couple of weeks. So uh, this has come to us as a first time presentation so that all we is it an action item for tonight's agenda to, to move on this? We are for all of the aforementioned reasons of trying to get and secure the item and then get them installed as quickly as we can, we would ask for your approval tonight. If you are not comfortable doing that, you can certainly table the item for a future meeting. Um, I would have to contact Shane about the procurement of those devices because we're going to say you can hold them for about a week and a half. Um, but other than that, we would go and back and see whenever you approach it. If you, we're not comfortable doing it. Well, I, I think my comment would be that given the information we've given, it seems like an extremely prudent thing to move ahead with tonight. The timing, the sooner we can do it with multiple levels of mitigation in terms of the effects of the air uh, is certainly valuable. But the, the immediate issue for me is improving the comfort level regarding the virus in any way, shape, or form we can. I think the other thing that's attractive to me is that it's a one time expense that has no immediate or long term tax revenue implications and it does not need to grow upon the fund balance which is an ongoing source of concern for the board so i think that uh, uh, i certainly would support a motion tonight to move ahead with it thank you jim i had the same uh, concern about uh, hearing something and putting it the same night but uh, i would ask if there are any board members who are not ready to take action on this if you could please just Say I or I, I have a problem with it. If not, we will uh, we will take action on, on going ahead with this project. So, is anybody not ready to do this yet? I can't see you, but I don't hear anything either. So, uh, I would uh, entertain a motion to uh, approve the uh, three hundred thirty-one thousand six fifty-seven from the remaining capital project funds to uh, fund the bipolar ionization project that we discussed this evening. Mr. Dunker, I could just add pending Jensen's final revision. For the terms and conditions. Pending the uh, final legal review of the terms and conditions. I make a motion, Fatzinger. Motion by Mr. Fatzinger. A second. Second by Dr. Warfel. Are there any comments or questions? Second by Mr. Hernandez. I saw your light. So uh, I can't see your mouth. <laughs> so uh, we have a motion and a second. Are there any comments or questions before we uh, take a vote? I thank you for looking into this, Art, and uh, this seems like a, uh, a godsend at this point in time with what we're faced with. And um, timing is, is certainly critical on this kind of a project to uh, move ahead like we're moving. So, uh, uh, Christy, would you please call the roll for a vote? John Cassiano? Aye. Willard Delacher? Yes. Joseph Fatzinger? Yes. Todd Hernandez? Yes. Todd Leiser? Yes. Rosemary Lister? Yes. Alan Rex? Aye. Rachel Scheffler? Yes. Jim Torkel? Yes. Thank you. Motion uh, approved unanimously. So we'll move ahead with that. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. John and uh, Shane and uh, Art for presenting this this evening. All right. Okay. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Okay, hey, going back to the agenda, we have to move up to the top of the page now, or middle of the page, where we have uh, a board president's report. And I do not have a report for this evening. I would just thank you once again for allowing me to uh, preside for our, over our meetings for another year. And uh, ask the superintendent, Mrs. Holman, for your report. I do. I have two things this evening. One, we will actually discuss that 3.01 on um, the attestation for is on the board agenda tonight. You do not need to approve this. It was submitted um, with what um, I believe your um, desires have been based on our health and safety plan approval. Um, Mr. Delaware did come in and sign it on Monday. 
as did I. And as you see on your agenda, you will see the item listed as um, we did sign that all or some of our students in the public school entity will continue to receive in-person instruction. And so I just wanna talk a little bit publicly about what that means um, because there was lots of news coverage and things about the attestation form. And so this really just renews our commitment. And so you have been readily involved each month in our health and safety plan efforts and reporting you know, cases that we've had as well as contact tracing and as well as what we discussed in our prior agenda item about layers and layers of mitigation and an attempt to keep everyone that um, enters our organization um, safe while continuing to value the um, value of in-person instruction. So I talked a little bit about that at the last meeting. Um, it does require us to follow the health and safety protocols that's put out by PDE and Department of Health in terms of what to do when you do have a case, um, which we have been following thus far and will continue to do so. They did change them right before Thanksgiving um, and gave some delineation for small schools, medium schools, and large schools, but we will continue to follow as they update guidance. The other one you will see that's linked in the, in the document is the adherence to the face covering order, which also changed. Um, directly before Thanksgiving. And so I think that was probably part of the impetus for putting out this form to school districts and schools is to um, have you renew your effort to be able to continue to follow the face covering order, continue to follow and be responsive to cases of COVID-19. Um, our safety protocols are being effective in school. You know, certainly that will not be without any cases. We have sent some communication about cases and, and I believe that will happen. You heard me mention tonight, we've been pretty successful in terms of either isolation of a symptomatic person or a close contact, as well as the mitigation strategies um, of masking, social distancing, as well as our cleaning and sanitizing. I believe the proposal you pr approved in the previous agenda item will certainly add to that in improving our ventilation. And you know, I think you know John captured it well in terms of you know the filter captures it, the outside air dilutes it, and now you're going to treat it. And so I think um, on the realm of us trying to do everything it is that we can do to keep our students and staff and anyone who enters our facilities and our classrooms safe, um, that was a, a good measure for us to move forward on. Um, the time has not been without challenges, as I'm sure you all have seen. However, we are in awe every single day of what our teachers and our staff are able to do and the top-notch educational services that they're able to provide to our students. Um, they are certainly committed, everyone in the organization, to not only education, which is typically what you would hear them be committed to, but also the health and safety of themselves, our staff, our students, and our school community. And so we really need everyone to follow all the protocols. We will be sending a message tomorrow to our school community, telling them about the attestation form and what it means. Um, we'll certainly during that agenda item, I'll entertain any questions you might have. And just giving them another reminder about you know, the importance of not sending students to school or staff coming to work you know, that have symptoms and following the protocols and just being really, as time goes on, um, we haven't seen this happen. We just want to continue the reminder so that that continues to stay a strict protocol that is what is keeping our kids in school and is able to continue our safety protocols. Um, the other thing is, and some of you might have saw it on our social media pages, um, the week before last, I believe it was, was what was called American Education Week. Um, it's our opportunity to celebrate public education and honor those who are making a difference and ensuring that each student receives a quality education. So parents were asked to submit nominations for teachers and we published the story that the parents submitted. We provided the staff with a little gift for their efforts. We did have nine staff members that parents sent information in about and um, I have delivered all but two of the little gifts. I do have two in my office that came um, right before Thanksgiving. Um, I, so I would like to publicly recognize and if you'd like to see any of the stories, they are on our social media pages, Mrs. Chandler, Mrs. Leverance, Mrs. Ashburn, Mrs. Conahan, Mrs. Holmes, Mrs. Metzger, Mrs. Buttock, Mr. Bennett, and Mr. Fritz. And so you will see the heartwarming stories that our parents submitted about um, not only what they're doing this year, and, and some of them are actually circumstances from previous teachers that they felt the importance to recognize our staff and, and um, they were certainly very appreciated. And so um, it's those little things that, you know, make our staff smile during this time because um, it is certainly challenging every day. Um, but they are doing a fantastic job as our students, um, as our parents. And so it takes all of us moving in the same direction um, to really keep everything safe. And so thank you. And we will send out information about the attestation to our school community tomorrow, as well as you know, certainly reminders to um, continue to stay the course because it's what's keeping all of us safe. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Holman. Uh, Mrs. Mendeke, would you please walk us through the personnel action for this evening. 
I will. Thank you, Mr. Delacare. It is a very short agenda this evening, only six items. They are usual business items for this time of year. I do ask for your approval on them this evening. You have the uh, personnel action recommended on your devices. I would entertain a motion. So moved, Fassinger. Motion by Mr. Fassinger. Second. Second by Mr. Rex. Comments or questions on personnel? I had one question, uh, Mrs. Matika, about the uh, student teachers. Are they physically uh, located in the classrooms with our uh, hybrid setting? Yes, they are in the classroom. Um, they are going through the screening process daily as a visitor, um, and we are limiting the number of student teachers for the second semester. Good. Just wondering if they're getting a good education. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Ms. Matika? Hearing on, uh, roll call vote, please, Christy. John Cassiano. Willard Delacher. Yes. Joseph Batzinger. Aye. Todd Hernandez. Yes. Todd Leiser. Yes. Rosemary Lister. Yes. Alan Rex. Aye. Rachel Scheffler. Aye. And James Warfel. Yes. Thank you. John Cassiano, are you still with us? Yeah, thumbs up. Oh, you gave us a thumbs up? Oh, okay. Yes. Unanimous. Thank you. <laughs> Motion approved. Thank you. Next item is under curriculum and building, as Mrs. Holman just discussed, the attestation form, which uh, was signed and submitted to the state. And um, you, have, you have that in front of you. You've had it on your uh, emails to a review. And uh, I would entertain a motion to approve that uh, form which was sent in. And you don't even need it. You don't even need to prove it. Oh, we don't it's need to. Information. It's just informational. But if you do have any oh, questions, um, it was already submitted. It doesn't require board approval. It know. does require us to put on our, our website, which it is there um, on the same place where our health and safety plan and our subsequent health and safety plan revisions are located. And so it is on our publicly available website and we will inform parents tomorrow. We just wanted to make sure because certainly if you would like to reverse decision, um, you can, this would be your time. Or if you have any questions, we will certainly entertain them. But other than that, we submitted it on your behalf on Monday. It is not an action item, but if you have any questions, I will be glad to answer them. Any comments or questions? Hearing none, we'll let it stand as is and move to the uh, high school program of studies revision. I believe Mrs. Yadish is on. Is that Mrs. Yadish? Yeah. She is. She's there. She's there. It is my turn. Thank you. There are just a few updates to the program of studies for the next school year. We will begin our scheduling process at the end of January uh, this year, and I'm sure it'll look a little bit different, but our counselors will be sure to be prepared. Um, the first update to our program of studies will be an update to the graduation requirements from the state of Pennsylvania. This actually was just approved this past weekend, and uh, they have once again pushed the graduation requirement uh, for our students to pass the Keystone exams or to complete an alternative pathway uh, as defined by the state. And it will now be for the current sophomore class. So the class of 2023 will be the first class to have to meet this requirement um, from the state regarding the uh, Keystone exams, excuse me. We have three um, major updates to the program of studies for next year. Um, the first is for a curriculum that was actually approved at last year's curriculum council. Um, this is for our U.S. government honors class. Uh, Mr. Hippensteel has opted to create an advanced placement government class. While he did get the curriculum approved last year, uh, it was his goal to do a pilot program this year with our students and to utilize some of the materials as purchased um, by the district and approved by the board this year. And it will officially become an AP class uh, for the 21-22 school year. So we're very excited about that. Um, the second is just a minor update. Tiger TV used to have a prerequisite of the broadcasting media production course, and Mr. Dinda and Mr. Zakora have opted to remove that prerequisite in an attempt to allow more students to schedule the Tiger TV. Uh, because it is a singleton class, it's sometimes harder to schedule, so they're hoping this will bring more students into that class as well. And the third change for next year is actually something that we also implemented very late this year. Uh, we were very fortunate to work with um, Moravian College 
uh, this past year, Mrs. Stitzel and I worked with um, a counselor there who helped our teachers to become adjunct professors for Moravian College. And we are very fortunate to have offered three, excuse me, four new dual enrollment courses this year to our students. That is college level Spanish three, Spanish four, accelerated chemistry, and uh, very excited to add this one, which was our dual enrollment music theory and composition class, as that now is another elective um, for a different um, group of students at our school who are looking to pursue music potentially uh, in their collegiate studies. And those are the major changes for this year's program of studies. Thank you, Mrs. Yanish. Are there any questions before we take action? Hearing none, I would entertain a motion to approve the uh, changes in the high school program studies. I'll make that motion. Motion by Mr. Rex. I'll second. Second by Mrs. Lister. Any comments or questions? Hearing none, uh, please call the roll. John Cassiano. Aye. Willie Delacker. Aye. Joseph Fatzinger. Aye. Todd Hernandez? Aye. Todd Leiser? Aye. Rosemary Lister? Yes. Alan Rex? Aye. Rachel Scheffler? Aye. James Warfel? Yes. Thank you. Motion approved unanimously. And uh, move on to the next item on the agenda is the memorandum of understanding with the Pennsylvania State Police. This is a, uh, this is a uh, routine item. We do every couple of years. Yeah, that's right, Mr. Delacker, and it was due. Uh, this is a requirement for our safe schools report. We uh, worked with Chief Vetterostic at the time to engage with PSP for the cyclical renewal. Uh, in addition to Chief's signature, Chief, the new Chief Tobin is also signed it as well. The new old Chief. The new old Chief. <laughs> okay. All right, uh, I would, I would entertain a motion to approve the MOU with the state police. I make a motion. Motion by Mr. Hernandez. Second, Second by Dr. Warfel. Any comments or questions? Hearing none, please call the roll. John Cassiano. Aye. Willard Delacker. Aye. Joseph Batzinger. Aye. Todd Hernandez. Aye. Todd Leiser. Aye. Rosemary Lister. Aye. Alan Rex. Aye. Rachel Scheffler. Aye. James Warfel. Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Moving on the agenda to uh, history finances. First item under there is the or the reports. Uh, Leslie, would you like to point out anything we should uh, be mindful of on the reports? Yes, thank you. Um, just a few things on the monthly recap to point out to you. Um, local revenues in terms of our real estate tax collection, we are ahead in terms of total dollars, but slightly behind in our collection percentage. However, um, as the board recalls, we did expect, extend the flat period through the end of the calendar year. So I do anticipate um, some timing differences compared to prior year, and I'm hopeful to finish out the year with a strong collection percentage. Um, the other thing I'd like to draw your attention to on the monthly recap are under the state revenues, the state property tax reduction, those gaming funds. We only received about half of our allocation from the state. Um, I'm not sure if you followed in the newspaper or not, but um, basically the state was anticipating to use federal CARES dollars um, to plug that line item in the budget. The feds came back and denied the use of, those fun of that funding. Um, and so that left a hole in the state property tax um, line item for the budget. So we received 50% of our allocation um, just, uh, this, I think either today or, or just a few days ago, um, the state did approve the uh, next six month budget and did approve dollars to fund the second half of that gaming revenues. So we do anticipate receiving our full allocation, but again, the timing is off. Uh, by this time, we typically have that full allocation. Other than that, everything is pretty um, routine. Earned income tax, you can see, as we had anticipated, is now starting to trail behind. Um, we're down about 3.37%. Um, projections from Berkheimer are estimating that we will start seeing about a 10% reduction on a monthly basis. 
Um, so this is the first month that we received um, that we look like we're a little bit lower. So we'll certainly keep an eye on that. Everything else is pretty routine unless there's any questions from board members. Any questions for Leslie on the reports? Hearing now, I would ask for a motion to receive the reports. Motion to receive the reports. Motion by Mr. Rex. Second. Second by Mr. Scheffler. Comments or questions? Hearing none, I think we'll take a voice vote just to receive reports. All in favor, aye. Sorry. Aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, next two items we can take together, Leslie, the bills and the payment of the bills as of December 23rd. Please walk us through that. Yes. So um, because we are early in terms of the timing of our board meeting, you'll see the checklisting for this board is um, rather small compared to normal. Um, so we are asking for approval of the checks that we have processed to date through tonight. Um, and then we are asking for approval to do a check run, which is a pretty routine item um, close to that Christmas break uh, around December 23rd. And the reason we ask for that is that so we don't have, so we can pay any bills that are due before our next board meeting in, in January. So we ask for that approval this evening. And that's a routine process that we do this time of year. It is. Uh, I would entertain a motion for 6.02 and 6.03, payment of the bills. So moved. Motion by Mr. Hernandez. Second. Second by Mr. Rex. Any comments or questions? Hearing on all those in favor, or please call the roll. Excuse me. John Cassiano? Aye. Willard Zellicker? Aye. Joseph Fatzinger? Aye. Todd Hernandez? Aye. Todd Leiser? Aye. Rosemary Lister? Aye. Alan Rex? Aye. Rachel Scheffler? Aye. James Warfel? Yes. Thank you, motion carried. Under other reports, uh, we have the enrollment report for information. Is there anything you'd like to point out, Mrs. Holman? Um, no, the um, November information is um, corrected. I would just like you to take a look at it. Normally we do not report in December because the meeting is so early. So you'll see November um, lined out, but you will see that on your agenda. And if you have any questions, I will certainly take them. Any questions on the enrollment report? Thank you. See, now we'll move to foundation report. Mrs. Stetzel, are you with us tonight? Yeah, I am. Thank you. Um, I didn't originally have anything to report. However, I just received something from the foundation this afternoon in that they are going to be holding an event called the 12 Days of Gifts. It's a fundraiser. Um, it's actually a Facebook event fundraiser. And within the uh, fundraiser for the foundation, you will have the opportunity to purchase raffle tickets and to win various items. Um, and I'm just going to read what the items are. Um, you could they have an iPad Air, various gift certificates, AirPods, ring doorbells, etc. So um, they're offering this um, and they will announce winners, I believe, on December 18th. Um, but if you have the ability to do so, I would encourage you. And if you have a Facebook page, I would encourage you to go there and check out the event. It is a fundraiser, which a eventually we'll come back and support our district um, in our in supporting our teachers and our students. And if I could just make one comment, you know, certainly we've all found ways to reinvent ourselves in this time and do things a little differently. And so I know the foundation is trying to do the same thing. And so they are very, very supportive of the district. You've seen the amount of money that they are able to raise that goes right into our classroom. And this is just one more example of another thing that they're doing. And it's a little different because I think they found a way to do it socially distant and still continue to raise funds and do something a little bit different to make it work. And so reinventing ourselves is what all of us are doing about now. Thank you, Leanne. And um, you know, we are blessed to have that foundation help us. So anything else on the foundation? Nope, that's it for tonight. Thank you. Mrs. Stitzel, thank you. And uh, we'll move into committee reports, beginning with the IU, Dr. Whipple. Uh, we have not met since my last report with the list. Okay. LCPI, Mr. Briggs. Yes, we had a meeting on the 23rd. Monday the 23rd was the Committee of the Whole meeting, which goes over audits and prepares us for the budget coming forward. And our next meeting will be on the 12th, or sorry, the 9th will be our next meeting for reorganization. 
you do for a new chairman? No, we're not. I think it'll be the same again. It's a two year game. We or heard two term game. Thank you. We heard from Dr. Uh, Dr. Barbara Kistler last uh, meeting about L Tri C. I have nothing further to report about that. Uh, Rec Commission, is there anything from the Rec Commission? Uh, nothing more at this point in time. Thank you. Um, there's no old business listed. Is there any old business from the board members who that you would like to have discussed this evening? Being non under new business, there is a donation um, of elementary music books for the Northwestern Elementary Band Program, uh, donated by Amy Wisser, and uh, all donations need to be approved by the board. So. Uh, Anything you'd like to add to that? I don't have anything, Kevin. Okay. Uh, thank you for, for donation, and we will certainly send her a thank you note should you accept it as we have done in the past. Thank you. And uh, I entertain a motion to approve that donation. Motion to approve. Uh, motion to approve by Mr. Rex, second I'll by Mrs. It. Lister. Comments or questions? Amy Wisser, oh, is she a, a No, is she um, I believe she is a parent of students. Um, okay. Leslie so, might so. be able to answer that. I believe Leslie had this communication. Yeah, um, actually, Maria, however, I can answer that one. So Amy, I believe, is a parent um, whose students participate in the BAM program and wanted to um, find a way to help provide more to the BAM program. And so she worked with Maria and Mr. Feast to um, donate music books. So I think um, Maria was very excited, and I'm sure Sean Fees is very excited um, for the addition of the uh, material for their program. Thank you for that. Maria, do you have anything to add, or is that good? Uh, just a huge thank you to the Whistler family for supporting the band program. Um, we were very happy to have a donation, and Mr. Fees um, asked me to publicly thank Mrs. Whistler, um, and I'm happy to do so. Thank you. Moving on to uh, new business. Any other new business from the board to be discussed this evening? Being on, we'll go back to uh, communications and open uh, up courtesy of the floor for anyone who is still with us who would like to address the board. Dr. Sosnovic, is there anybody raising their hand? I do not see so. Okay. And we'll move to uh, communications. There is one person right there. Yes. One person, okay. Mrs. Mead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wasn't able to make a public comment in the beginning, so I'm going to do it now. My name is Kathy Meath. I am a trustee on the Circle of Seasons Charter School Board. I also have two daughters at the school. That address is 8380 Moore Lane, Fogelsville, 18051. I have been part of the COS community since the beginning. When Northwestern Lehigh School District first granted COS a charter in 2013, my family was thrilled and grateful. When a renewal of the charter was sought in 2016, it was not admittedly a smooth process but we have worked through those challenges and have grown steadily and carefully under the leadership of a highly professional and competent administration. I was in attendance at your last board meeting on November 18th. In that meeting, I was puzzled when I heard Superintendent Jennifer Holman report to you, the board members, that COS did not provide all of the requested charter renewal materials, specifically items in exhibit B. As was, as was said by uh, my board president. As a board member, I received regular updates on the progress of compiling all the materials and confirmation that these materials were in fact received. In fact, I wrote some of the narrative responses myself to uh, answer the questions in Exhibit B. Uh, I just wanna highlight that after receiving the September 9th letter where um, all the the 126 requests were written out. Our principal and CEO, Ms. Sager, quickly, promptly organized the request into a spreadsheet consisting of 20 categories, 61 folders. 
She organized various team members, produced a timeline and a system for uploading and reviewing the documents in a timely manner. Uh, she created a 14 person team made up of administrators, a board member and teachers to gather, write and upload the information needed to complete these requests on time. In addition to this core team, many others, myself included, contributed narratives to respond to the questions. It was through the diligent efforts of COS staff, 821 documents in both exhibit A and B were uploaded into the uh, Northwestern Lehigh School District shared drive on November 6th, ahead of the November 8th deadline. I just wanna add that um, within exhibit B, there is an absolute treasure trove of letters from parents, teachers, and also children. I think there's even a video in there addressing you, the board members of Northwestern Lehigh School District. So this is an opportunity for you to hear the stories and vo voices of the Circle of Seasons community, um, explaining why they chose COS and how they value the educational experiences we have embraced. So I'm just urging you, the board members, to read them. They were specifically um, addressed to you and we collected them for you. I just want to thank you so much for working with us through this process. I know it's not easy. I know you're supporting every single child in Northwestern Lehigh School District, and I know that's not an easy task. Uh, as it was said before, I just want to let you know that it is my hope that we can work together and we can create open lines of communication and work collaborat collaboratively as we move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Meese. Dr. Swiston, I'll make that under any other. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Is there anything more to say? Yeah, yes, sir. Get them right now. Mr. Pizzolato. Hello, uh, Christopher Pizzolato. Um, I live in uh, Brinigsville. Um, I actually just had a question. Um, I know that you know you had said at the beginning of the meeting that the uh, the Circle of Seasons issue was not on the agenda for the evening, um, and it would be at a later date. I was just wondering what is that later date? Um, you said it was it would be brought up later, but you didn't say exactly when. And I know there are a lot of people who did want to speak on that. I'm one of them, um, and I would just like to know when is the right time for for people to to show up if that's if that's the issue that they want to address. Um, I can certainly respond to that. We don't have a date at this point. I will certainly um, talk with our council about including the date that <clears throat> so we can relay that to your board of director, your board of trustees, so that they can certainly relay that information to whoever would like to speak at that meeting. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? No, sir. Thank you, Mr. Posado. <clears throat> uh, Secretary Cassiano. Are there any communications for the board? Yeah, I have, um, Mr. President, one item tonight. Uh, I received three documents tonight from the president of the board of trustees at the Circle of Seasons, and I'm giving them to you, the board president, to enter them into the record. Okay, will do. <clears throat> Is that anything else, Mr. Cassino? That's it. Thank you. At this time, we'll have uh, administrative and building sharing. Uh, Dr. Sisnovic, will you please take the lead on that? Yeah, absolutely. Mr. Kaviko? <clears throat> Good evening. Uh, nothing to report, but I would like to say uh, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to everybody. Thank you. Mr. Kibler. Good evening, everyone. Uh, nothing to report. An additional uh, happy holidays and a Merry Christmas to everyone. I continue to enjoy my time at Northwestern Lehigh High School, and I look forward to the future. Thank you. Mrs. Matika. Nothing further. Thank you. Mrs. Pulley. Uh, yes, uh, Mrs. Burlett and I just wanted to share that our elementary music teachers are all working together to provide our first ever virtual sing-along. 
It will be held on December 8th, so next Tuesday, mm -hmm. beginning at 7 p.m. We will be advertising for the event um, for all of our families, and everyone will have an opportunity to join the program and enjoy an evening of singing Christmas carols together virtually. So we are looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. And Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to everyone. Mrs. Frisbee. <laughs> Nothing, thank you. Just happy holidays to everyone. That's all. I just hope everyone has a very safe and holiday. Mrs. Burlap. Just we hope that you all can join our event that our music teachers are putting together. They're very excited to be able to offer a sing along virtually and happy holidays to everyone. Mr. Zimmerman. All right, I'm not gonna be as brief. I just need to provide the board um, with a brief update on winter sports, if they'll allow me. Um, just an update, we are uh, cautiously moving forward uh, with this season. Uh, we've met with uh, our medical partners at LVHN. We met as a Colonial League uh, and as District 11. Um, all of our coaches and student athletes are currently wearing masks, including while they are practicing and competing. Um, I'll tell you what, our, our student athletes are absolute troopers. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I know Ka uh, Mr. Casiano and I probably wouldn't have uh, fared as well wearing a mask in the sports we played. Uh, but these kids have accepted it and, and my, my hat's off to them. Uh, contests are slated to begin Friday, December 11th. Uh, now, some of the bad news at this time, uh, due to the reduced mass gatherings uh, and, and capacity limits, and with the strong recommendation from our health partners at LVHN, uh, spectators will not be permitted uh, at, at our winter events at this time. The only exception is going to be we're going to try and get the senior parents only in for the senior night contests. Uh, so the maximum that will be will be 12 people. We'll make sure that they're socially distanced and they're masked up. Uh, for, for that event, uh, but we want to try and make that opportunity available to those, to our seniors uh, in the winter sports season. Uh, you know, as always, uh, we, we will monitor the situation. Uh, as it permits, we will open up our facilities a little bit more to spectators out as it allows, uh, and we can safely do so. Uh, this is going to be the way it's going to be at, at the Colonial League schools in general. There's going to be no visiting team fans and uh, some of them are wrestling with either no spectators, period, or looking at uh, allowing those senior parents in. Uh, so, again, that's my update on winter sports. And I'm, I'm crossing my fingers. I met with Mr. Mutimer uh, today. They are uh, currently rehearsing for a good old-fashioned uh, big family Christmas. Uh, we are going to perform that in front of no audience, but we will live stream that. We're going to have two shows uh, on the 19th and 20th. So I'll get information out to our community so that they can partake uh, in that from, from the comfort of their own homes and support our, our uh, student performers. Uh, so that's about all I have right now. I do have a meeting coming up with uh, Mrs. Klein, our band director. We're gonna try and find a way to, to uh, get some type of concert going in the next couple months here so we can safely do so. But um, right now with the uh, numbers increasing the way they are, we're, uh, we're being very, very careful. So. Thank you, that's all I have. Mrs. Edmonds. Happy holidays to everyone, nothing else. Mrs. Yadish. I have nothing further this evening, thank you. Mr. Oaks. Uh, happy holidays to everybody and just thank you for your time tonight and, and making that decision. That brings it to me, I just wish everyone a safe and wonderful holiday and I look forward to seeing you in the new year. I would have said ditto. I would have said a safe and healthy um, break for whatever it is that you do with family, and friends, or um, <clears throat> alone, or it looks a little different this year, but certainly um, health and safety is, is most important and uh, certainly those that you love. And so thank you, and I will see you in the new year. Okay, thank you. And. Uh, for board sharing, we'll uh, go around the table as if we were all sitting here in person. So we'll start with uh, Mr. Hernandez. Uh, I'd just like to uh, extend um, Zimmy uh, the thanks to all the hard work he did for our ball sports. 
and keeping it safe and keeping it going forward. Um, and the work that he's doing for the activities and the fall, I'm sorry, the winter sports and winter activities as well. Hopefully we can get those in. Um, I know it'll be very welcome by all the parents and, and the kids as well. And I'd just like to congratulate him on being a two-term mayor of Titletown. <laughs> uh, he was recognized on, on WFMZ um, and touted on the BRC quite a bit too as well. So thanks a lot for all that hard work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hernandez. Uh, Mr. Rice. Yes, uh, Merry Christmas to everyone. And I'm sure you're all excited to see that calendar turn to January and we'll start a fresh one. The 2021 is the fresh part. <laughs> Mrs. Lister. Yes, um, some thoughts that come to mind and just with all the different um, speakers and comments are everyone's really working hard to be safe and creative solutions and supportive with uh, generous donations, for example, from Mrs. Wisner and supportive. And I also want to say, like, you know, interviews like I see with Mr. Zimmerman or social media posts, it's very positive and professional. And I think that's a real testament to the um, positive environment that everyone works so hard to attain. So happy holidays and thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mrs. Scheffler. Yeah, Alan, you uh you said it like I was going to say it, 2021 has got to be better than 2020. So I just say happy new year to everyone and let's celebrate a new year. Thank you. Mr. Leiser. Uh, thank you. Not a lot more to add. Uh, have a great holiday, everyone. Um, looking forward to having some great conversations uh, in the new year. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, bring it around to Dr. Warfel. Uh, just a safe and healthy holidays. Uh, in addition to Mr. Hernandez's mm -hmm. remark about uh, Jason's effort on behalf of our community, uh, Jason, the coverage you got in the newspaper for what you did with District 11 football was really quite remarkable. So uh, it's not only immediate here, but you're, you're having a broad reach in terms of providing student athletes with amazing opportunities under difficult times. So congratulations. Well said. Uh, Mr. Cassiano. Yes, I just want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas. I'd like to add uh, that uh, Zimmy was a very handsome guy on uh, WFMZ. He looks good on TV. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Brad Singer. Happy holidays, all. Thank you. Attorney Moyer. And uh, I Th thanks, Troy. Happy holidays. Thank you. Same to you. Uh, you know, for all the uh, remarks that we've uh, heard this, this, this evening about the, uh, the quality of the education that we're bringing to our kids and the environment that we're creating for them to keep them safe and healthy. And uh, I would like to announce at this time that there will be an executive session immediately following tonight's meeting for legal purposes, and we'll have to log back in to attend that meeting, correct? Okay. And uh, the next uh, meeting for the board will be on January 6th, which will be a workshop meeting in the boardroom, and there will be an executive session for personnel after that January 6th meeting. With that, that would entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn by Mr. Rex. Second by Dr. Warfel. Meeting adjourned. Thank you very much. Just, 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 and the meeting for everyone.